Hello, everybody. Oh, I haven't done one of these for so long. Welcome to my Natalie Dance, Becoming Natalie Dance, my Raw and Authentically Me series. And in today's video, I am super, 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 super beyond excited to be able to talk to you today about narcissism. And with me is the man, the legend, Luke Hawkins. He is the number one life coach in Australia. So we are currently recording this with him in Sydney and me in the UK. And he has the number one life coaching business in Australia, became a millionaire before he was 30. And he trained me with my neurotransformation transformation therapy programs, um, which is now what I call my manifest to love program my eight week intensive program so um just check that out in the link below if you want to find out more about that and how this man transformed not just my external life but internally as well through the training that we went through um so yeah let me introduce you Luke Hawkins everybody (laughs) well thank you no good and yeah really great to be here and it's surreal to do this with you because of seeing how much you've grown over the years since we began and it's only a short time, but you know, here we are. So congratulations, all, all of your growth and all the great things you're doing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And I just reached over 50,000 subs on YouTube yesterday. Yes. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Do you remember when I came to you, I think I had, I think that was a dream, wasn't it? I remember saying, oh, I want to have a really successful YouTube channel. And I think I had maybe like a hundred people following me then, which was uh, just three years ago. It's crazy. It's wow. But thanks to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks to you and, and all your training. I've been able to create this multi six figure business, which is just like, yeah, it's dreams, dream oh. stuff, dream stuff. So yeah. So amazing. So, um, so yeah, so today we're going to be talking about narcissism. Now you're the expert. I'm the victim was <laughs> the prey. <laughs> The prey, I was the prey, no longer the prey. And um, yeah, was was definitely somebody caught in the narcissistic trap my entire life, not just in romantic relationships, but family members, their enablers, um, friends, um, bosses, you name it. I was surrounded, surrounded by narcissism and narcissists and um on a variety of different kind of so on on a like kind of different spectrum as well so so I think yeah I think with all of your incredible um knowledge that you have um why don't I hand over to you um and just talk about you know kind of how, how does a narcissist become a narcissist how do we recognize a narcissist why are we attracting these not very kind people into our reality and what we can do and what are the red flags and and I guess as well I think you know like the variety of different ones because you know some people have these preconceived ideas that you know all narcissists are shouty shouty well I used to be the shouty shouty person based on their horrendous behavior towards me because I didn't have any other tools so so yeah so it's uh, let's take off the myths of what people think a narcissist is and let's dive into what a narcissist truly is and the varieties. Yeah, so I think it's a good place to start of what is a narcissist. And I became fascinated about this because over the years, been 10 years now, that I've been running my life as a coach and my business as a coach. And it's been seven years now that we have had this life coaching school and the number one life coaching school in in Australia. (laughs) And we've been recognized by Forbes and we've trained over 2,000 students now and people as amazing as yourself from around the world. And so I became interested in this topic simply by hearing stories of students who had come to me who had been through narcissistic relationships, as you have been yourself. (laughs) And so I became fascinated with that. And so I think it's important to start with what is a narcissist. And a narcissist is really someone who uh, lacks empathy and or they have what's called performative empathy. And I'm going to go through what that is later but they generally have low levels of empathy, ability to understand what you may be feeling. And they're very entitled. They are arrogant. They will be egocentric and they will chronically seek validation and admiration and approval. 
So they're very superficial. Now, because they're so superficial, this also means that they do not regulate their emotions very well and they are easily triggered, um, you know, in, in when people say things to them. So they're, they're very thin skinned and easily triggered. So they're very reactive to things you may say or do. And with this as well, because they struggle to regulate themselves so much, the, the source of this that you need to know, the, the core of narcissism is that they have this deep insecurity about themselves. And the deep insecurity is, is that you might find out who I am. And who I am is at my deep core is I actually don't believe I'm all that much. <laughs> I am um, really deeply insecure about myself and have this deep negative self-judgment of my own sense of self that is so not enough. I have such a deep insecurity about me not feeling enough that because of that, I need to carry all these protective behaviors and sabotage behaviors. And I need to protect myself from feeling any shame. And if you ever shame a narcissist, then you know for sure that you're going to get war or you're going to get trouble. So they really want to avoid shame and they're motivated by dominance and control and really anything that's going to make them feel safe uh, and, and make sure that they are perceived as this, you know, perfect, uh, you know, amazing person. So uh, I, I would like to look at that. Yeah. <laughs> for anybody yeah. that says no to a narcissist, <laughs> watch out. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I feel that now one thing that relates to what you said before is, you know, people get stuck with narcissism because they're waiting to see for the person to give them real genuine human responses and they're not going to get that. And so some people will spend in relationships. I think you said you spent, how long did you spend in your narcissistic relationship? The last one was like five, nearly six years. And yeah, I mean, I could be crying and they just look at you like, it's just, it, it's just the most oddest thing, the way that they manage empathy or the lack of, they don't know how to. And so, yeah, yeah, so this, this empathy piece is like they either have none or they can fake it. None. So, the, yeah, yeah, so there is some narcissist that can actually fake it though. So they will be like, oh, like, oh, your brother's sick. And you, and they're like, oh, poor, poor you. But I'm going to care because I'm going to use it some way to get what I want. So it's not like a genuine, that I call performative empathy. I'm going to perform empathy on you to get what I want or I will have none at all. So they have these, they have the ability to actually, a lot of people, um, that's a myth of, of some people perceiving that they would have no empathy. Some narcissists are good at performing empathy. It's not genuine, but they would perform to have that. So they might say, oh, your brother's sick. And then they're like listening to your story. Oh, your brother's sick. Da, 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 and they're like, oh, yeah. And then you say, yeah, but that's really making me feel bad about myself. I'm feeling really down and low. But now they're like, they tune out, they check out because they can't hold it. It's not genuine if they ever can perform that way. Yeah. And that's the tricky part that the clients and what I, what happened with me is that they get the nicey, nicey bit and they think, oh, and then all of a sudden they get the, the not so nice bit and they can't yeah. work out what the hell's going on. And then so it's a performance. Yeah. Yeah. It's a performance. So this is where, why people would stay so long as well, because you're expecting sometimes, oh, they're just going to be outright terrible, shitty behavior. No, they're manipulated, manipulative. And so because they manipulate people, uh, it's hard to sometimes read their, their behaviors. And, and so, and, and people will spend a lot of time. You spent five or six years with yours. Some people spend 20, 30 or more because they're thinking that the person is going to change. Uh, or they're just believing their behaviors at face value when they're not genuine. So narcissistic people will view others as objects. It's like your toaster. So you're like, oh, I need my toaster, but I only need my toaster to get toast out of the toaster. But once I've got my toast, I don't need my toaster anymore. So I'm going to get back to what my agenda is and only focusing on what my needs are. And that's what's most important to me but your needs are only important to me as long as I can get something from you <laughs> and get my toast. <laughs> so they, they, they will go on about their day. They will not think about you. They could live their entire day. It's like you didn't exist, 
But when I need toast again, I need something from you. All of a sudden, I'm back. So That's why they can effortlessly disrespect you, cheat on you, mentally, physically abuse you without any feeling because you're the toaster. Yeah, you're, you're the toaster. You're only uh, uh, something that I can use to meet my needs. <laughs> okay. And I don't need to think about you unless I need something from you. <laughs> So, yes, I, I, I like people to know that we can go into, you know, whenever you want around the warning signs. But um, I just want people to know that when you are in a relationship with a narcissist, you definitely can't take the behaviors at face value because they are very good at performing. I mean, I remember I remember sitting here once crying my heart out because of his behavior towards me. And I sat on this chair in the corner and he was sat there and he was look, just looking at me. And I was literally like like sobbing like I was in so much pain and hurt from his behavior and he was just sat there just like like looking at me like like just nothing it was just it was dead it was just it was dead there was nothing there like you know obviously if that had been a quote-unquote normal relationship with a quote-unquote normal person you know that person would have been like look come here you know I'm really sorry I didn't mean to hurt you like that let's talk about this I hate seeing you like this what can I do what do you know what I mean and and, and it was like it was nothing there was absolutely in the six years when I was with this person I had like 0.0001 percent support and and no sympathy in, in in anything nothing yeah so this this uh you're with a type that looks like that they had we'll call it low empathy or none right very low ability to perceive or feel what someone may be feeling or understand their feelings but that that also what's interesting about this is you would ask yourself why is someone like that or where would that come from and when I think about this, I look at a person and I'm very interested in their childhood and the relationship with their childhood. So for someone to react that way, some possibilities as to why they would, if I have certain childhood needs growing up, if my childhood needs were not met myself, then I actually haven't learned how to do that for others. And I probably believe that I don't deserve to have my emotional needs met. So if, if I don't deserve it, then why should you, <laughs> right? So <laughs> if I've had none, you think about it, if I've had none of my emotional needs, if I grew up and I did not feel heard, understood, I did not have my emotions validated, uh, I did not feel seen or that I mattered when I was feeling low emotional place. So from this, I'm probably thinking my feelings don't matter. I don't deserve to have my feelings validated. So why would I give that to someone else like I've, I've never received that for me whereas, so whereas yeah. somebody who could also have had that similar upbringing that you know maybe it was a busy household maybe um you know certain things happened in the household where that person wasn't seen or heard or you know um yeah given the attention or the nurturing that they needed but they could turn out to be somebody that over gives and over pleases and sure and so then you've got the opposite of the kind of I'm going to put my empathy back and suppose and then you've got somebody kind of people pleasing going well I want to give you that because I didn't get it and if I give you it then maybe I'll get it back from you and it's yeah and so this comes back to that it's never the experience that is creating the behavior for the person it is the meaning that they have attached to that experience yeah. and I would say that you know whether a people pleaser is born or whether someone who's gone into codependent relationships or someone who's struggled to ask what they want or they shut down emotionally, whatever it may be, it's all from the meanings of the events. But someone who could not, uh, you know, actually sit there and, and understand what you may be feeling, what also could be for them is they actually fear themselves that that might bring up emotion for them and they don't feel safe to process that themselves because they never felt safe processing that emotion growing up. It was never felt safe for them. And they don't have a strategy in their own brain, probably, to safely process emotion. And it would just bring up too much negative self-judgment for them. So that can be one of the contributing reasons yeah. as well. And definitely, I just had a, uh, some evidence popped into my mind of that being true with this person, of something that happened. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I would never, like, th there was this person that um, I'd met and lost his girlfriend in an accident 
and it was about a year later and he said to me I, I don't know, I, I'm just not coping with this I don't know what to do with this and he was like we were just having a chat in the pub and I told my ex-boyfriend now about it and he was like I would never do that I would never open up my feelings I would never speak like that and like for me that was a normal thing for this person to say because they're struggling and I wanted to like just listen you needed to be heard but for my ex-narcissist it literally was like that's just no you just just you just don't do that yeah yeah and so people who don't feel safe to process their emotions uh, naturally one of the responses is they're going to dissociate <laughs> and they're going to separate themselves but it's um so just their learned response yeah learned response <laughs> there's a different types of narcissism narcissists so i've had like you know family members who are very shouty and angry so that kind of common one that we see with the narcissist being screaming and shouting in somebody's face um to the this the the one that's kind of quite silent the one that will um punish you when you least expect it the one that will ghost you or gaslight you or put you down or ignore you or yeah say something abusive to your face when you least expect it but it's a punishment in something that you've done or said um yeah. what is yeah so that's kind of what I had quite a lot of with a variety of different people and friends um, so, yeah, maybe we talk about the, the different types of narcissism. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah. So in the psychology field, they will talk about how there is five types of narcissism. And the first type of narcissism will be overt narcissism. Okay. And overt narcissism is someone who will be very arrogant, uh, entitled, um, overbearing, and they will have this exaggerated self-image um, competitive and, you know, really, really lack empathy. So th th that's more of the most common narcissist that you will see, you know, where they're very competitive, entitled, overbearing, you know, you should treat me this way, but because I'm so grandiose and I'm so amazing, but you don't deserve that. Um, and, and they're very expressive about it. <laughs> okay. So that would be the overt narcissist. And would an overt narcissist be somebody that would cheat and lie Yes, they, they they will because they, they, an over, overt narcissist will be um, exploitative. So they they will lie and they would cheat uh, an, an overt narcissist for sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. The second one is going to be covert narcissism. Okay. <laughs> and covert narcissism is someone who might be more introverted and they will have um, definitely low self-esteem um, but they will have a tendency to feel or play the victim. And so, you know, you try to hold them accountable to their behaviours, but they will play the victim card on you that because of their past or what they've been through, because of something wrong with them, they're a victim. So they won't take responsibility for their actions at all. Like it's, it's they're a victim in this exchange, so right? It's your fault. You're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. It's your fault. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a victim and they're very self-focused. So yeah, the, the, those, um, you have to look out for those covert ones because they're not overtly um, telling you how amazing or grandiose they are. It's just if they do something that, um, you know, is not, you know, good towards you, then they, they will just be a victim about it. <laughs> um, yeah, and you, can, and, you, and you get confused that way because people you go like, why am I so confused with the narcissist? Because I, I know that, that I did, I know that they did the wrong thing, but then I'm asking them like, why did you do that? But you will never seem to get a direct answer. <laughs> never, sorry. And you feel like, and this is the, this is the one way I would I would always describe to, to even my clients. If you feel like you need to take a tape recorder around with you to record every conversation, that's damn guaranteed that you're with some form of narcissistic person because they they will literally that you you cut they, they will say that they haven't said things. They'll say mm. that they haven't said things. They'll say things to your face. You'll confront them about it, but they'll say that they didn't say that. They make you feel like you're going bat shit crazy. And yeah, so, like you need to record conversations. And that's the whole confusing. You're like, but I only said that, but yet they've turned it into that. What? 
And yeah. that, that's amazing. So what can be a part of narcissism as well that is a common behavior? And covert narcissists will definitely use defensiveness and playing a victim. Uh, but the way that it can be used as well, and, and any type of narcissist really, is this thing called gaslighting, right? Oh. And, and, and so what gaslighting is, is it happens really in three steps. The, the first uh, step of gaslighting is that I deny your reality. So you're telling me that this thing happened or that I did this thing, but I'm denying. And I'm saying, what do you mean? That didn't happen. I never said that. Uh, I never did that. Like that never happened. So now all of a sudden you're questioning yourself. Like, fuck, like, did it happen? That's the tape recorder. But then the second step of gaslighting is that um, now it's um, you're the problem. So it wasn't me. It's you're delusional. You're a psychopath. You're crazy. You're the one that is the problem in this whole thing that's going on. And so now you're like, fuck, now you start to feel guilty. You're like, shit, like, why did I bring that up? Am I in the wrong here? Why did I bring that up? And then the third thing to get away with it is usually there's trust involved. And because there's trust involved, um, where on some level you have an emotional investment with this person because you can't usually get away with gaslighting. You just meet them on the street and they tell you that didn't happen and you're the problem. You're like, who the fuck are you? Like, get out of my life. But because you've emotionally invested in this person um, and usually what the person has done is they have loved bombed you at the beginning. So what, what they've done is they've showered you with praise, with compliments, with gifts, with all these positive things. Tiffany and you're jewelry. Like, Tiffany jewelry. Yeah, yeah. And now you're like, fuck, now I'm emotionally spiked. You've hit me. You've given me a dopamine hit and this serotonin hit where you've just spiked me emotionally. And now I'm like, fuck, now I'm, a, I'm like, I want more of that. But, but and, and what makes me want more of it is that at any moment you pull it away. <laughs> and so now you've pulled it away. You've, you've pulled back love. You've pulled back the attention. You've pulled back the praise. You've done something uh, negative towards me. And now you're, you're actually dependent and now addicted to getting the next hit of dopamine. Um, and they've taken you on this emotional roller coaster. And now you need it again. And so you're more susceptible to tolerating the shitty behaviors. Yeah, and, and just kind of like, just want to say to people that are watching this, I'm not like some materialistic bitch that just needs Tiffany jewelry. But it was the, it's the fact that I had such low self-worth that this person had come in, was love bomb bombing me, was telling me all the things that I hadn't heard for so long, was treating me in a way that I'd always wanted to be treated. I mean, I was literally going around, people going, I've met my soulmate, I've met my soulmate, I've met my soulmate, I've met my soulmate. And then on top of that, it was, you know, and I had very little money then. And on top of that, it was like, he'd come to see me and he'd have Tiffany jewelry and like just and 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 we'd go and stay in these beautiful hotels and have beautiful dinners and and all this yeah. stuff and it was just like it was dream come true shit stuff for me and so it wasn't just obviously about obviously it's nice to get jewelry but it was like I couldn't believe it was like I couldn't believe my luck I was finally being treated like a princess like somebody that was truly wanted and loved and so that's the love bombing feelings that I got because I couldn't see yeah. So like I for sure would always recommend to people watching this stream that if, if you don't know the person very well and it's only been a short time together and they start showering you with praise and gifts and compliments, you've got to ask yourself, how did this person come to such a clear conclusion to give me all of these compliments or praise and gifts that I deserve this when I've known them for a week? Or the, I've barely shared anything about myself and, and now I'm getting all these things. So that should sign a red flag. I would want that for people. Yeah, I just want to share. But so anyway, so the second type of narcissism, we said covert nar narcissism. So they're defensive, they're avoidant, they're low confident and they're introverted and they're very good at um, playing the victim. Okay. And, and that's what gets you to question yourself um, when you're with a covert narcissist. OK, and now the third one is an antagonistic narcissist. Now, an antagonistic narcissist is someone who has a high tendency to want to take advantage of other people. So they're just out there to take advantage of others. There's some people that you meet 
and they're like, that I can see clear that they, you know, I just barely know them, but they're like, oh, can I have this from you? Can I give this? I remember going on a date with a girl myself and I barely knew her and it was the first date. And then, you know, I always will pay for dinner when I take girls on dates. That's my values. But then when we got in the car, she's like, oh, by the way, can you fill up my petrol tank? And I'm like, it's halfway. Like you've got enough to get home. It's half. She's like, no, baby, but can you just fill up my petrol tank for me? And she, so she got, wanted me to get out of the car. And I was like, I'm a nice, like, we'll get into how you attract, you're attracting a narcissist. I'm a light giving energy. They love givers and they can see giving people. So all of a sudden I'm filling the petrol tank and I'm paying a hundred dollars for her fuel. And I'm like, fuck, why am I doing this? Well, whatever, I'm a giving person. I'll just do it. And then we get to my apartment. She's like, oh, by the way, um, I've got this wrapper in my car. Do you mind taking all this rubbish out of my car and put taking it up the elevator and putting it in your bin? Um, you know, could you do that for me? And I'm like, you want me to empty the rubbish out of your car as well? So this person was like, so an opportunity to take advantage of me. I'm a giver. That was an antagonistic narcissist. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> right. So I would um, watch for that. And they, they have high disagree. Uh, I would call um, disagreeability. So they disagree with you a lot. Some people just disagree. These are entitled, sorry, these are entitled people, people that feel entitled. Of course so, they will, will be entitlement as a base for a lot of these, yeah. yeah. So they could be entitled for somebody else's money just because they're married to them or they could be entitled to somebody's pension or somebody's like, you know. They're yeah, in I'm, I'm entitled because I'm me. I actually don't even need a reason. Like I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I'm an entitled human being that it's not warranted that I deserve this larger slice of the pie. Like you must say, I've been married for 10 years, honey. Like, can you please cook dinner tonight? Like probably some warrant, like warranted, right? But hey, honey, could you cook dinner for me, you know, three times a day, clean everything, um, give me 500 a day allowance. Um, by the way, um, I'll only talk to you when I want to talk to you. And, you know, so uh, it's just somebody. not warranted. I know Entitlement. somebody that's married to somebody like that and it literally, <laughs> I've only just, and this person was in my life for like 20 years and I've only just realized from speaking to this person's partner who this person truly is. And it was like, I didn't know this person and how I, and now I know that and that person's no longer in my life, no longer in my life. But now I know that he's now being treated this way by, what did you call this? An antagonistic. An antagonistic narcissist, yeah. yeah. The entitled no. Entitled, but and really wants to take advantage of people, willing to yeah. take advantage of anyone yeah. with no no guilt. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I did the right thing. I did the right <laughs> thing by walking away. No from the so this is the other thing that I want to share. It's some people that come out of these relationships, and if you're watching this stream right now, is that some of you are waiting for the person to say sorry, <laughs> and they and they they and you're like fuck. If they just say sorry to me then I will be able to let go. But the only problem is, is because they have low empathy or only performative empathy where they perform that way and they have low, low levels or to zero ability to even feel guilt, then this means they're never going to say sorry. Well, I so, actually had, well, you know, you talked about the, um, the very rarely that they would. <laughs> it would put on the performance. So I mm. did actually have a narcissist years ago say sorry to me. But right. I know that it was to entice me back or to keep yes. me dangling. I know that it wasn't a sorry, sorry. Yes. I understand. To keep the power dynamic and 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 have control and power. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I mean, that where they really value power and dominance and control. Okay. So, so I, the I, story from a narcissist is never a sorry. If you did get a sorry, it's never a sorry. It's never a true yeah, sorry. It, it's but like, and it's very rare. Like I never like to make absolute generalizations that a narcissist could never generally apologize. Like I believe in the neuroplasticity of the brain and that people have the ability to make new neurological connections and therefore change their emotions and behaviors. But for a person to be able to get to that place, they really have to experience enough negative consequences 
to want to do that. And and it shouldn't be your, it's very rare that you're the one that's gonna do it. Some are like, like, oh, if I just, you know, you know, just be patient, if I just keep tolerating their lying or their cheating, like, you know, I've just got to show them more meditation i've just got to show them more books and then they'll change but it's very rare in that one that they will it's, it's very rare yeah and that's the thing is that a narcissist isn't necessarily going to see that there's anything wrong with them yeah and so like the, the only way that you would ever get to that place is if you experience enough loss that you're like okay the consequences of this loss is too much for me i have to now look inward and be honest with myself but that's definitely uh you know not an absolute and not common so i wouldn't you know i wouldn't sit on hope mountain and 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 be waiting for it yeah <laughs> um yeah so all right so we know the third one we know the antagonistic narcissist and now the fourth type of narcissist is actually a communal narcissist and i find this one really fascinating because this is someone who is easily morally outraged and they react uh, strongly to things that they see as un unfair. So if they see something that is unfair um, in any way, then they become very, um, you know, highly morally outraged and they put themselves on this pedestal that they have this strong moral code. Um, and it's, it comes from their own inflated self-importance that I'm so great, I'm so serious, I have these high morals and anyone that doesn't have these morals, like they become easily outraged by that, by that, by seeing that. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's just a type to look out for. Okay? There's, a, there's, a, there's an actor that I've never met, but when I think of this actor, I think of that. Like it's about their own self-importance. Yeah. So like you might be like, oh, but like it's not about generally caring about the thing. It's yeah. like, I have such an inflated ego self-importance that that is why I'm so morally outraged and basically that's why I'm doing the thing because I'm so grand I'm so great um you know that's that's why I care about this thing and you're just not that grand and great and that's why you don't care and so there's some people that will be like all right I'm going this lifelong mission I'm gonna be like all right climate change or all right um you know you should give to this place, but it's not generally giving to the thing. It's like, no, I just want ego significance and importance yeah. for people seeing me for caring about the thing. <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly what this one act, obviously I can't mention his name. I'll tell you it once we finish recording, but like this- You should say it, you should say it. <laughs> I can't say, but when I think of him, I can, he's, a, he's an extremely good actor and, um, and I can just about watch his films if I disassociate the truth of him to, to his acting skills. But yeah, he's literally that. Oh, the communal. I need to be seen. You need to hear me. I'm this. Ah, oh, and and it really and you just like you just go, mate. You're a fucking actor. Get off the fucking stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. So yes, that that, that is the mind. communal narcissism. And then uh, the last one is malignant narcissism. Oh, and. Now, Evil this is one that, malignant that you really want to stay away from because the bad thing about this is they actually get in, they don't only do, not only do they create pain for others, but they actually enjoy creating pain for others. And it gives them pleasure to create pain for other people. And they're vindictive and they're revengeful. And this is where you actually see the breakup and you thought you knew the person, but then you find out after the breakup where it's like, all right, can I see the kids half the time? And you see kids the other half the time. It's like, no, I've got the kids and now I'm gonna let the kids know how much of a horrible, terrible person you are. And I'm gonna intentionally make your own kids hate you. And not only that, I'm actually gonna make sure that you don't even see the kids. So I wouldn't even have reasonability that you should, and I've seen people come through my courses like this, where they're literally, they're, it's like sadistic, where you're, you're actually enjoying giving other people pain because of how much pain you're in yourself. <laughs> um, and that's when you're like, I thought I knew the person, but now you're out of it. It's like, you are the enemy number one. And it's like, you don't even have a, a soul or a heartbeat. I'm just going to make your life intentionally difficult. Can you give another example for people that don't have kids? Uh, you know, that one obviously stands out because, you know, I've got friends that, um, you know, are 
uh, with somebody that, you know, with people that have like left their, their partners that they've had children with and they do get treated like that. Um, and that it's always their fault, you know, it's their fault, it's their fault. So that's why they need to be treated, treated badly and kids being held back from them and things like that. But can you give an example of people that are in relationships with narcissists that don't, you know, that don't have kids? Maybe, maybe it's a boss or maybe it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend relationship or husband and wife. Relationship. No, this is great. So because the person, uh, you know, enjoys giving pain to other people, uh, and, and, you know, really could be vindictive and aware of the pain they're giving others and they know about it and, 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 it, and it feels good to see others in pain, uh, they also can be very aggressive. So maybe in your relationship they are, they are aggressive, maybe they are physically abusive or maybe they have um, such a strong temper. But not only would I look for the aggression, because they are so threatening towards other people and aggressive and vindictive and uh, you know, enjoy giving pain to other people, they see everyone around them as a threat. So you might be with them and they're like, what, 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 like, you know, what my, oh, you're telling you, oh, your mom's like out to get you or your dad's like, I wouldn't trust your dad or, you know, you know, that friend of yours, like I wouldn't trust him. Like they see every single person as a threat and they're paranoid all the time. They can never trust anybody. So something with the malignant narcissist is they struggle a lot trusting anyone because they treat people so poorly and enjoy giving people pain. And, you know, there's many ways that you could make someone's life painful for them. You, you could call them names. You could, uh, you, you could tell me personal, here's one. You could tell me something really personal about yourself that you don't want anyone to know. And you're like, I'm sharing this with you because I want to grow with you and I want to deepen this connection with you. And you share it with them. And then, they um you have a time where you don't meet their needs and then all of a sudden they're gonna use that against you uh and make you feel horrible about yourself like tell other people or just throw it up tell, other, tell, tell other people um it, it could be anything at all where they perceive that you haven't met their needs and you haven't done what they wanted and so yeah. now they're going to be vindictive and they're going to use what you shared against you and they're going to create pain for you and they will see that they're creating that pain and still go ahead with it. Do you so find I, in, 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 with the, the people that you've um, come into connection with that have experienced narcissistic relationships, when it comes to family members, do you find that it's like the head of the household is, is generally the, the, head, the narcissist? The, well, the narcissist. It, it can be, but have you seen relationships where the people got into a relationship and just say this person had a lot of friends um, and or they had a close relationship with their parents or their family and their friends and all of a sudden the person gets in a relationship and all of a sudden they lose the relationship with those that were close to them before they got into it. Before then, they were close with their parents. They were close with their friends. But now they're completely being isolated and they're being told so many negative things about everyone else around them because that narcissist didn't trust anyone. Um, they've isolated the person and now they can fully manipulate the person a lot easier because they've taken them away from their own safety network and, and their own you know, safety nest. They've taken them out of their own safety nest and turned them against the people that are closest to them. <laughs> so a malignant narcissist will do that. I had an experience with, a, with um, someone who was a friend of mine where we were um, outside together and I shared something very personal with him. And I said to him, hey, like, this is something very personal with me. Like, please don't share this with anyone else. I trust you. And then there was another person that was there in front of us, another friend. And they, um, because I started to bring up shame for them, they then decided to put me in a position where I had to share the very personal thing in front of them um, and give up that thing about myself because they started to feel shame. So they became vindictive and I, they could see the pain in my eyes and they still continued to make me feel terrible about myself. <laughs> I know um, somebody that has been isolated from- Being 
isolated from your family and your friends, I would definitely look at that as a as a as a malignant narcissist and trait. One one thing that kind of um, I mean, I've literally I've pulled myself, and and this is one thing as well. Like you want you want to have an abundant life, you want prosperity, your wealth, you want love and kindness in your life. If that's kind of you know, and you want to be treated with respect, obviously that's all the healing work that you need to do to see yourself as that and see yourself as worthy of that. But you can't bring anything toxic into this new life that you're trying to create for yourself because it would just keep pulling you back. Um, which is why one of the things I talk about really openly is why I let go of so many people. The majority of people that I knew that were in my life no longer exist in my reality, no longer are in my life. I have like two or three friends. That is it. And they are healthy. They're kind. They're loving and they're supportive. And they're all that I need. Um, and that mm. happened through a process of me seeing my worth and growing and healing and ascending through, you know, spiritual journeys and practices and, and everything that we talk about through, you know, the healing programs of the neurotransformation therapy, like my manifest to love, um, programs, um, yes. to, to elevate yourselves, to understand that, you know, you don't have to be somebody that shares, you don't have to be somebody that is in a, in a place where you feel the need to keep going when it doesn't feel good. You know, I mean, I, I remember sharing stories of people that then they would, and I would be crying and they'd be laughing in my face, Luke. They'd be laughing. Oh, I don't mean to laugh. Really? You don't mean to laugh and buy, about my pain. It's just, you know, it's just, it, it's ridiculous. But what, one thing that kind of um, really screams really loudly to me when you've talked about the varieties of different narcissists is that there is, when I'm thinking about certain people, they had a bit of that, a bit of that, a bit of that, a bit of that, and a bit of that. So can you have that kind of elements of, yeah, of course. traits yeah. in in yes, I, 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 and this is where I really love about neurotransformation therapy is we don't, um, you know, like to give someone just one label and that's the entirety of the of of someone's personality. <laughs> okay, it's it's not or the entirety of a human being. It's like people have the ability to express elements of all different traits and all different parts of personality. So for sure, a narcissist can demonstrate elements of any of these five elements. I would say that they would have a primary place that they operate from. And, and that is something that you would look out for, but for sure, I just want to help people detect. If you want to detect a narcissist, just look for when the moment that you don't meet their needs or the minute that you hold them accountable to a behavior that wronged you, look at how they respond. And, 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 and when someone is not, when you are not meeting their needs, and or that you're holding them accountable to behavior, you're going to see their level of emotional intelligence and see what traits are expressing. And that should be a sign. Ghosting, gaslighting, some form of punishment, disrespect. Yeah. Like, you know, like, like, it's like, if you tell someone your emotional needs and they're not meeting them and, and you're asking them, oh, do you mind not doing this? And they you pretty much project it back onto you or they're not willing to take any responsibility or they check out or tune out like you or, or make you the problem like you, you you have to detect that early as possible and just know that people play patterns and so and when, you have to... one thing that happened to me with my ex was that everything was always my fault I was damned if I didn't I was damned if I didn't it was always my fault it, it didn't matter if I spoke up it was my fault if I didn't speak up it was my fault it was always it was always my fault and uh you know he 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 would um and forced me to go to um, see psychologists. And I actually remember my psychologist saying to me, there's nothing wrong with you. You're worth more. She said, I'm not even allowed to tell you this, Natalie, but you're worth more. You are worth more. She used to say to me, if I put a hundred people along this road right now, and I told them exactly what it is that you're going through, they would say, they would react exactly the same as you. You know, the only reason why I was reacting to this person's bad behavior towards me to a level that I was, was because obviously the triggers from my childhood, obviously, because that was what it was bringing up. That's why it hurt even more. But this person that I was with made me feel like I was the narcissist. They made yeah, me feel and, and it's funny as well, because you know, somebody that I met last year, you know, I was like, you know, wanting to kind of show them that I liked them and show them that I thought they were a nice person. 
And when you think about kind of things that you've said, you know, when a narcissist would do that, but I was doing it from a different perspective of, you know, this is what I believe I needed to do. So, and and that kind of, and then you're questioning yourself and you're going, am I, am I, am I a narcissist? Yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, you can give someone praise and give someone gifts and give your best self to someone and do it from a place of, of, of you honoring yourself and honoring your own values because you're essentially just a caring or a giving person yeah. Yeah. and that's what I want people to recognize is it's okay to be a caring and giving person and want to give to other people and it doesn't make you a narcissist right a narcissist is someone who has an, an, an intention to serve themselves <laughs> right so you're if you know your, your intention is to serve the other then it's, you don't need to question yourself. And it, it relates to where people who come out of these relationships or have been in them for enough time, your self-trust becomes eroded yeah. and you question yourself more than what you ever have. And because your self-trust is so low, you, you lose your sense of self and you lose your identity and you very often lose your self-value. And so what I would encourage people, and this relates to how you heal after a narcissist relationship and I think step number one is to just be honest with yourself that you have been through this experience yeah. and it has a negative impact on you, that it, is, it has caused you to lower your self-trust and form negative or lower beliefs about who you are. And so owning that is step number one. And then step number two is I think you should um, believe that this is changeable and you can heal yourself. Look and at yes, and that gives you hope. And then that leads to step three is if you want to do a program, something like Natalie's program, and you do want to do the deep inner work, then you can do that, you know. Um, you know, and I I have my offerings as well, but but the advantage is is by doing these tools and and working with someone like like Natalie and doing these tools is is that you can actually get to the root cause yeah. of of these issues. And, and quickly, and really quickly, yeah. And that's the misconception as well about about therapy is that people think, oh, they're going to have to have therapy for like 20, 30, 40 years. You don't. You get in, you get done, you get out, you get given the tools of what it is that you need to do. You break through the barrier of why you have such low self-worth, why you attract these people. And you then get given the skills um, and the, you know, by the neural, neural, new um, pathways mapping you get given the skills to be able to keep this new reorganized way of thinking moving yes. in the direction that you want to move in so you have the tools to be able to do that through breaking through by getting that root cause because that's the biggest most darkest belief that you're holding on to about yourself which you carry around with you in like a little suitcase everywhere you go and that's why you are attracting that oh. Of course. And so maybe take this in the, you know, in our closing uh, section now, maybe if you want to tell the guys about what you're offering and, and how you can help. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so you attract based on your level of worth. And when a narcissist, we're just using narcissists as an example here, because that's obviously what today's um, video is about. A narcissist will recognize you by coming in, talking to you, they'll recognize that you are prime meat for them yes. by how you feel about yourself, how you speak, the words, the language that you use. And you're using that language based on the level of worth that you have about yourself. So when you elevate your self-worth through a self-love healing practice, when you deep dive into what these traumas are, these limiting beliefs that have created this low self-worth and you transform from the inside out, you lift and shift this shit you know, out of you that you've buried the goodness underneath and you lift the crap out and you push it out and you embed and recode the mind through understanding what the root causes these traumas and getting the learn from your subconscious mind, you're able to then transform from the inside out. So then you're raising your level, you're raising your vibration because we're all energetically connected. We're all vibration, like attracts like. You'll then attract healthy people, healthy relationships, because that is how you'll see yourself. And so then when if a narcissist, if a universe decided to test you, or you know, if you see it that way, or a narcissist came into your life, you'd recognize it straight away. 
And you would, in, in, in this, in here, you would trust your inner compass. You would trust this to turn away from it. No, thanks, mate. I've worked too hard on myself to allow you to come into my reality. See you, mate. Goodbye. That's, I want to be here. No, that's amazing. That's exactly what they should do. So what should they comment below if they to express interest in what you offer? How should yeah, they do so that? The link's below the video to the Manifest to uh, Love program. It's an application program. So you need to apply for it because this isn't just for anybody. This is for the right people that are ready to do the deep work. It's deep work deep healing work, releasing traumas that you've been holding on to your entire life so you can transform your life from the inside out. So, so just click the links below this video um, and and um, just follow the steps to the link and you'll know exactly what to do. The other thing that I wanted to say as well is, you know, if what, what I've done and I followed my passion to helping people across the globe heal through healing their hearts through this, this deep work, this neural pathway um, mapping techniques that I've learned through the neurotransformation transformation therapy programs and my um, incredible intuitive skills that combined is just like a game changer. But um, I've transmuted my past pain, my past hurts, my past experiences to create this incredible business that I'm so proud of. I've taken my pain and I've transmuted it into something incredibly powerful to help you all to heal. So you can all experience the love, the life, the relationships, the the money, the you know, the finances, the 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 friends, you know, the abundance that is available for you for all of you, the successes, it's all there available for you. You just have to heal to 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 know that it's there for you because we're all the same. Um yeah. And so by transmuting that, I feel, yeah, being able to help people. So there's another, this is what, you know, Luke offers. This is uh, with, with Luke's um, life coaching business is that, you know, not only can you go to Luke to, to learn, um, to learn the neurotransformation therapy techniques but for yourself, but you can also take that and become a life coach too and take this and you can then transmute your pain and your relatable experiences and bring that to the table to help people. And you will attract people into your business that are relatable for you that you can help. And that's exactly what's happened to me. So you can actually use these powerful skills that you learn through your healing process, the neurotransformation therapy, whether that's through Luke or through me, and you can take that and get a certification to become a life coach too. So um, so if you do want to um, find out more about Luke's um, offerings, what's your uh, what's the best place for people to contact you on? Is it your email address? Is it at... I'd, I'd probably just say message me on Instagram at Luke Hawkins. <laughs> yeah, at Luke Hawkins on Instagram. So you can DM Luke. Um, yeah, DM Luke um, yeah. Uh, on, on Instagram. So there we go. So yeah. wow, I just want to say thank you, like to you as well. Like, thank you for having me. And thank you for allowing me to, you know, share my knowledge with your audience. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm very grateful. And yeah, this is a blessing to see where you have come from you know, just a couple of years ago to now being a thriving neurotransformation coach and therapist and healer. And uh, you're being so extraordinary at what you do and helping people. So, you know, you're an inspiration for so many and your audience is just, uh, you know, so blessed as well, I believe, to be able to receive your wisdom. So, Thank you. And I'll just feel great to be part of this journey with you. And, yeah. yeah. And thank you so much for your time. Honestly, you're, you're the inspiration and you, you've literally transformed my life in ways that you, you, where, well, you know, you know, you know what you've done. So, uh, yes. Um, there we go. Thank you so much for your time. So, um, it's the evening time for Luke in in Sydney. It's getting pretty late for him now. So it's probably time for his bed or for, for, a, for a, a cold one or something in the heat. Lucky man. <laughs> And um, guys, thank you so much. Um, please feel free to like, share, comment and subscribe. Luke also has a YouTube channel as well. So you can find Luke on YouTube. And yeah, comment below your thoughts about this, your experiences. And let's inspire other people that they too can heal through these traumatic traumatic relationships and experiences that they've gone through with narcissists because it's not just a normal relationship this is this is a different level of relationship with a narcissist so yeah thank you ever so much for listening guys and as always i will be back very very soon